Partnering early for community infrastructure is vital. The Council worked with the Department of Education and TESA Education in helping to design and coordinate the state-of-the-art facilities here at the Beta 12 School Riverbanks College in Anglevale. This is a genuine partnership of projects to establish a shared use arrangement. You know, it's not about retrofitting facilities. We're able to be involved early on to influence the design of facilities and to maximise community use. Anglevale and Apparel Downs are two uh, significant growth areas in uh, Playford, so lots of residential growth. Um, our citywide planning told us that we need to construct social facilities in both of these areas. The building of Riverbanks College provided a unique opportunity for shared community space, like the two core indoor gymnasium behind me and playing fields that will be accessed by the community after school and weekends, helping to build a vibrant, happy and healthy local community. Council partnering with the South Australian Government and TESA Education helped to bring forward these shared community facilities earlier than expected, leveraging the local government and state government investment so our community can get to use these facilities from day one. But then importantly for council, it saves council significant sums of money to build standalone facilities. If council was to go it alone and build these facilities, they would cost you know, in the order of 10 to 12 million dollars by partnering with the state government we were able to save the community a significant amount of money, but then ensure that the facilities are utilised to a really high level. Working together, the innovative partnership model was able to bring these community facilities online earlier for greater access as our community moves in to Anglevale. And uh, welcome, welcome to the second uh, forum associated with the Sharing Schools Building Communities Exhibition uh, it, as part of the ARC Linkage Project Building Connection Schools as Community Hubs. Uh, delighted to see you all here. I'm Ian McShane. I am from the Centre for Urban Research at RMIT University and we are one of the partners in the ARC project uh, led by the City of Melbourne, uh, so led by the University of, uh, of Melbourne, sorry. Um, and firstly, um, uh, uh, also a welcome to the panel. Delighted to have you here. I'll introduce them individually as they speak. Um, I'll just skip through those slides there. And I did want to begin by acknowledging country uh, and, and just say that, um, um, that we're meeting uh, on the unceded lands uh, of the Boonwurrung and Woiwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation, and I want to pay uh, my respects to their elders. Um, I also want to, to point out the image that we're using. Uh, the artwork is by an RMIT student, Mark Cleaver. Um, Lewatini is a Palawakani, Palawa word, for Milky Way. The Palawa mob are from Tasmania, as indeed am I. Um, and for Mark, um, this represents a connection to something larger, this image. And that seems an appropriate metaphor um, for the discussion that we're about to have about communities and the places in which they meet. But the video that we've seen previously, uh, which um, starts off uh, with the city of Playford mayor and, uh, and official talking uh, about a, a marvellous new facility, um, a school as community hub built uh, in that northern region of Adelaide, um, they tend to use the more prosaic language of infrastructure and facilities. Um, now, there's um, been some amusing commentary that I've read recently um, uh, by um, a UK um, social commentator called Dan Gregory. And uh, I'll let you read the quote there. Uh, For something so vital to our economy and society, it's odd that the term infrastructure is so dreary and unappealing. Uh, perhaps it should be rebranded altogether um, as something altogether sexier and, and, and more 21st century. So 
Gregory has had a bit of a play around with the language here. Uh, and he ran through a few alternatives, experimented with a few alternatives. Life kit, key forms, system works, base layer, grounder. He even tried underwear. But then uh, he cast them aside and settled on the metaphor of a civic operating system. And that term tends to resonate with what we've been hearing in our research, where senior school staff um, in schools that play a role as community hubs are seen as civic leaders and describe themselves as civic leaders uh, as much as school leaders. And it's that civic dimension um, of the school as a community hub that we want to discuss tonight, um, specifically by asking what are the benefits for communities of schools as community hubs. And I'm consciously using that word in the plural, communities rather than community, because in any spatial community, of course, there will be multiple communities, faith communities, political communities, uh, communities of identity, even virtual communities. Uh, and that reminds us that the concept of community can be exclusive as well as inclusive. But anyway, to discuss these issues and more this afternoon, we have a diverse panel that reflects the complex sectoral and jurisdictional and program settings of the school as a community hub. So I will introduce each of the guests in detail as they speak, but what I suggested to each of them is that they broadly address a number of points. Firstly, I'll ask them to describe their role and the relationship with the community hub um, uh, on, and whether they have a particular example that they would like to share with us and speak to. Um, I've asked them if they could talk about what they see the benefits uh, and advantages are of having a hub rather than community and educational services that might be more decentralised. Um, uh, what are the gaps and the pressures that they have experienced and they see in infrastructural planning or running programs? Uh, and I'm conscious, as we were talking beforehand, that we've just had two or three years of COVID, um, which may set a context for some of that discussion. Um, and then, well, what do the community say? What, uh, what about community responses and impacts? And, and how do we know? these things. So with that rather simple brief, uh, um, I, I'm happy um, uh, panel for that not to be a script but just for you to um, respond as you feel best. Uh, I'll ask each of the panel to speak for about 10 minutes uh, and gently remind you when that's coming to a close and then we'll open up for Q&A. <laughs> okay, now firstly um, if I can introduce Tara, our first speaker. Um, uh, I'll keep that, Tara, because I think that we've just got the one slide for you. Uh, while I do it sort of complex um, ta management task here. So I am delighted to introduce Dr Tara Fritjidavong, who is a community service specialist with more than 20 years of senior management experience in local government, private sector and not-for-profits. Um, Tara holds... Um, uh, her undergrad work was uh, in arts and social works and um, um, has postgraduate qualification project management and wrote um, a PhD in cross-sectoral innovation in this broad area. And I have to say, Tara, I have read your PhD and found it absolutely um, illuminating. Um, but currently, Tara, you're the manager of community services and social infrastructure for the city of Maribyrnong. And there you lead a team on the development and impl implementation of a community infrastructure plan, 2051 for the city. That's pushed out an unusually long way for uh, a local government plan, in my experience. Tara, welcome, and over to you. Well, thank, thank you. 
thank you, uh, Ian, and, and, and look, thank you for um, um, Melbourne University and RMIT for actually bringing all of us together to share and, and to have this forum. I think it's a, a great um, achievement and I'm, I'm looking forward that we do more of this because it's, a, it's certainly an area that I think is uh, have huge uh, implications and opportunities for us in terms of how we respond to the need of our community. So, um, in terms of um, my 10 minutes, I'm just trying to work out how I can be um, uh, speaking to the point that's probably most relevant to you. As Ian mentioned, I mean, I started off um, my work or career as a social worker, um, as a crisis social worker responding to any kind of issue coming through a community, whether it's be it domestic violence, financial, legal, case by case. So I was doing that for about five years and then started to realise that I can be sitting here dealing with case by case basis and how do I contribute to the, the community. Then I, of course, moved from that to policy and uh, managing large number of teams in terms of community services, where it's supporting the age, children services, young people, family. So done all of that service delivery design. Then I also then realised that so much of this is also connected to infrastructure in our community. So, um, so the journey from that then move on to further work in terms of research. Um, my PhD thesis focused on innovation and how we collaborate in a multi-sector perspective. So City of Port Phillip was a project, my case study, actually. And, um, and within that, there's about 26 different organisations coming together to work for the city to address the health and well-being for the community. So out of that um, work, then that sort of, then I got back to local government and my current role, um, Ian referred to the, the plan that we've been working on um, for the last five years. Um, what I was finding in local government is that often we've been asked to address a specific project or issue, but there's a real gap in terms of long-term planning. So over the last five years, I actually established a, t a team that actually focused on research and also the analysis, but really looking at uh, community infrastructure. So within my portfolio, there's about 30 uh, sites and assets uh, that all at various different life stage in terms of asset. Each one <laughs> needs some work uh, and, also, and obviously supporting the, um, the community um, within that neighbourhood or in that city. So hence we've been developing a community infrastructure planning tool that actually projected over the next three decades in terms of the need of the city. Um, and, and from that we actually now know exactly what we think the need of the community will be over the next three decades. And then it's from that perspective that then we reflect on all of our social health and well-being policy and how we actually then translate our plan and that is actually embedded and informed by our aspiration about health and well-being and all of the human rights, social justice principle, uh, all of the uh, environmental uh, aspiration, uh, all of our social policy will be embedded in our planning and our thinking moving forward. So that that's a, a project that I'm uh, very keen to share with everyone on that. And we've been working on the key principle that actually drive our thinking and our uh, asset management plan for the next 10 years already. So, so that's been locked in, which is great. Uh, in terms of project, as example, I think I touched um, before uh, my direct involvement, of course, on the other arm, which is the de delivery of project. Uh, the Footscray Learning Precinct is probably a good one. I know a few people here actually have been involved in the early phase. Uh, that, that piece, that project itself, I think is really um, quite... Uh, um, relevant to what we're talking here today. So we actually, a few weeks ago, just launched the last piece of the puzzle, which is um, completed about 10, not 10, but I think over the last five years, the Footscray Learning Prison has managed to um, attract over $100 million state government investment now to complete that aspiration, just in terms of the physical infrastructure side of things. I think, um, so the, the project itself, the aspiration is about creating a connected learning opportunity right from birth, right through birth to death, basically. So connecting to all of our community centres and um, so we got uh, Early Years Hub from birth 
return child health, kinder child care and play uh, supported program, primary school, secondary school, Victorian University, the surgery uh, in, and also then our community hub uh, for adult learning. So there's a, a whole life kind of uh, plan and vision that comes with that. So physically we managed to achieve that with the $100 million investment from state government. But the challenge now for us is to actually address the, the, um, the content, you know, the program, the quality and the standard. That will, you know, will be uh, an ongoing process. So in terms of the benefit, look, I, I certainly uh, 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 a strong supporter of Community Hub and uh, particularly what we're dealing with is that we're constantly faced with scarcity in terms of resources and how do we optimise in, um, in terms of function and how we support the community is such a critical element of that. But it is a, a challenging and complex space. You know, I think um, bringing um, such a diverse professionals and thinking and mindset, uh, it require commitment, it require a shared vision, it require a common ground that keep us coming back to that common ground, which is really the community at the end point. And, and how do we navigate all of our differences in opinion? And, and, and not only that, getting ourselves as professional on the same table, but also then taking our community with us as well. So community engagement uh, and consultations and voice is such an integral part for any project. I think, I, I can't imagine any project um, being successful without the support of the community. So that, that's a, such an integral part of our work. So, um, and, and the end point, when, when we actually um, succeed in creating a hub, the, the ripple effect, it transforms neighbours, neighbourhoods. It actually transforms a city. So a number of our project now would actually will be a transforming kind of um, outcome for the city. One of the projects I'm working on at the moment, we are pushing for $130 million investment to redevelop the Footscray Library into um, what we're calling now the Creative West Precinct, which bring together library, performing arts, and the whole creative industry sector. That would actually, hopefully, if we were successful, uh, we're in the year number five, but that type of project would take about 12 to 15 years to actually accomplish. So we're only in a year five. So um, if that project was to be successful, that would actually reshape the entire Footscray city in terms of um, its contribution and, and the support to that particular community and the city. So, so I think in terms of the end point, it's definitely uh, a major, major um, contributor, uh, a factor in terms of health and well-being for any kind of community that sustain the social infrastructure, the capital, um, human aspect of any kind of city. I think I might leave it there. Have I done my ten minutes? <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Tara. Thank you, Tara. Now, I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Ruth Hamilton. Ruth is the coordinator of early childhood services at the city of Greater Geelong. Ruth has worked in the community services sector for over 30 years, particularly working with vulnerable communities, including supporting children and young people in the criminal justice system, managing and teaching in the aged and disability services sector, and teaching in the prison system uh, and the alcohol and other drugs sector. Um, managing projects that support school transitions uh, and, and, so, and much more. You've also been the principal of a school for children with trauma and you've managed programs for young people who have been isolated or removed from the school system. That is a pretty amazing working life. Um, Ruth, delightful to have you and over to you. Thank you. Um, I think one of, the mo one of the reasons I popped that information into the um, bio is because one of the key things I think for community hubs and integration is passion. And my story is, um, I, I come, you know, back 30 years ago, I started in the disability sector working in institutions. And 
it was the time of deinstitutionalisation process going on and so we were working with young adults and adults who were going into the community. I then went into um, the community services sector and I was working with adults who were um, re-studying, coming out of the prison system, wanting to uh, re-skill up to work for themselves. I kind of then found, okay, well, I'm getting into a point here where it's kind of still a little bit too late to, to support people. So working in the prison system, phew, I tell you what, I thought I was pretty open-minded until I went to a women's prison. And, you know, I didn't think women were criminals at all when I first started there. And I was, my eyes were opened incredibly that a lot of the women in this prison were such victims of a whole range of things, whether it be family violence, drug and alcohol, whether it was um, social security fraud back then. And these young girls, 18 and 19 years old, were incarcerated for these crimes. And again, I thought, it's too late. It's too late. Even the education and training that I was providing was just that little bit too late. So I then went to the youth sector and started working with young people in the criminal justice system, particularly young men and women who identified as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And we worked on a project in Geelong with them. And it was, again, an incredibly interesting experience and they taught me so many things. But again, it was too late. So I then went to the early childhood sector and I started working in early childhood and I went and got my qualifications in early childhood. And I started working in an integrated centre that the City of Greater Geelong had opened some years ago. And it was fantastic to think we could actually make a significant difference to children from birth. And that the services that our integrated services had were a multitude of services. There was playgroups, there was maternal child and health, um, there was supported playgroup programs, there was gym, uh, gyms next door, there was mothers groups, there was new mothers groups, there was new parent groups. And there was all these things that we could see from a collaborative approach that were making such a big difference. And then I got an opportunity to actually be part of the Karain Birali um, build. And I heard about this, this organisation called Our Place. And Our Place was, um, was, was what we'd first heard about it was there was going to be this organisation who, who was philanthropically funded, who was going to work with the Department of Education and the school and us as, as the City of Greater Geelong to actually deliver um, early learning programs on a school site with the school. And we thought, wow, this is actually incredible. So my, my passion then went, I actually have got to be part of this. And it was interesting that I was actually teaching um, a number of the people who were going to be moving into these centres around integration and what integration looked like and how could they work with each other. And I went, oh, actually, I want to be there. And I met with some of our Our Place team who were talking about the research that they would be doing and they were talking about the qualitative and the quantitative research that had been done and the outcomes of Doveton, one of their first, well, their, their lighthouse site um, went with the Coleman Foundation. And I thought, this is going to be amazing. This is not just going to be a place where we can actually make a difference. We're going to be able to actually show what the difference is. We're going to be able to really look at the strategies that we need to put into place to make those changes happen. So I've been um, with... I started off at Karain. We were amazingly lucky to work with a fantastic Our Place team and the school team uh, called Northern Bay. And we were able to work together for the first few months until COVID hit. <laughs> But the thing was, is that right at that very early stage of our relationship, we actually developed a relationship and we developed a really good working relationship. We had a lot of fun, we had a lot of laughs, but we were also really aware of the constraints of what we were about to launch into. And so we actually set some really clear parameters and some, some great ways of working effectively together. We were still on site. Our place were actually having to work from home, but we were still able to connect with each other virtually, which, you know, who would have thought we'd be working from home and actually being having meetings on computers all the, all the time back then? So it was, again, that's probably one of the key things around working um, with, that, with the hubs is that relationship development and the, and the passion and the collaboration and having that one entry point. I'm not sure if you've seen the, the display down oh, up, upstairs, that Karain Birali has a one point of entry. So all of the families, all of the staff all come in to Karain Birali through the front entrance and they go to school through that entrance. Our place team is sitting there. The, our place team have actually got lots of activities going on. They've done lots of research in the community to see what we actually need, that we've developed a strategic plan together to look at the four year kind of commitments and the things that we need to be doing in this particular community. They've engaged the community. They're still continuing to engage 
to the community. Uh, this morning I went into the centre to talk to some of the team and there was a playgroup operating and um, it was through the, through the um, our, our place team had actually worked with the Northern Bay team to actually get the families who were in that community together to come to access those services. So the community themselves are now accessing a whole bunch of services that they probably wouldn't have been before. They're attending our long daycare, they're attending our kindergarten programs, they're attending our new parent groups. And now we've got on site Early Help, which is a collaboration of a number of organisations. So you can see that we're starting to grow and we're actually starting to recognise that there's a whole number of different services that our community actually needs and are using and are going to use. So that was, that's been, I suppose, one of the best parts of working in this particular environment. The people that we're meeting, the research that's being undertaken to actually really demonstrate both the quality and quantitative. I mean, there's no one blueprint that you can have for any of these hubs, but there is a number of things that are, I suppose, key common um, commonalities for, for the particular hubs. You know, that single governance model, having that one door approach, as we said before, the number of different holistic services, sharing of information with each other, um, but also to, as I said earlier, that collaboration between teams. You know what it's like when you're trying to make contact with someone over the phone and, and until you meet the person and sit with them and they're on site with you in the office, that relationship hasn't necessarily developed. But when you're in the space with them and you're co-locating, you've got that incidental conversations or those incidental experiences that you're working with each other on. Um, one of the other things that I think has been a, probably the biggest challenge for us initially was coming from, I've worked in both the primary sector, secondary sector and now the early years sector, is the connection between the two different opinions and approaches sometimes to, with children. So the early learning, you know, our kindergarten programs, we're really working hard with children on um, successful behaviour and transition to school and, and being able to spend, you know, a certain number of hours in, in, the, in a particular program and developing friendships and understanding what it means to actually be an active part of the community. And then they go off into the big wide world of school. And sometimes there's a different approach by the school teams um, to our approach. So we've had to work really hard on that and we've had to really work hard on the common language and also to the common approaches. What does it mean when you know, we have kindergarten children who are really struggling with self-regulation, who are really struggling with their emotions, um, really difficult for them to transition away from their families, and then to go into a school where they're expected to sit and, and play base isn't, that, isn't um, part of the program anymore. We're really lucky that our school next door still has a play base program that supports children to, to, in their learning. So that was a little bit of a challenge. You know, the principals would say, well, no, the ch children have to go home at lunchtime because that we actually can't have their behaviour in the room. And so the parents would be so excited that their children would be going to school so they can go and get a job or, you know, work part-time, but they'd have to come pick up their children at lunchtime because their behaviour was not acceptable in the school system. So working through those, some of those challenges to say, well, how do we actually get this, um, this uh, journey for the children to be as successful as it possibly can be? So that has been a little bit of one of our challenges. That one of the other challenges that we've had is probably the change of staff. Um, we started off with a number of staff that were, you know, had one sort of set of uh, values or ideas and then another lot of staff come on board. So it's redeveloping those relationships again. But it's been able to happen and it's actually been a really positive output for, for the teams as well. Yep. Oh, yes. Okay. Cool. Um, see, I should have I should have put my own timer on. I have so many things that I could say. Um, but I think one of the, the the key things for us as the city of Greater Geelong is that we've been working with. Um, integrated services for quite some time, and so we see the benefits of that hub idea because we, we understand the benefits of having so many different services together for our particular community. Um, and as I said, there's those key things that passion and collaboration are probably the two key things. So, thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, there's an awful lot in here. Um, now, um, I'd like to introduce Caroline Manasseh. Um, and Caroline is from St Dominic's Catholic Primary School in Broadmeadows. Caroline's worked there for 21 years. Uh, well, been associated with St Dominic's for 21 years. Uh, firstly, as a parent helper and is now the community hubs leader. And that is an interesting transition, um, Caroline. Um, I think um, I'll just turn it over to you and ask you to introduce uh, St Dominic's uh, community hub. And um, welcome, Caroline. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. 
Um, I've been working at St Dominic's, as Ian said, uh, since um, for 21 years. And uh, as a parent helper, I began there uh, doing lots of volunteer work, you know, helping in the uniform shop and helping and assisting in the classrooms. And, uh, and then I decided to um, go and do my course and become a learning support officer. Right at the time, it was called Multicultural Educational Aid. And, um, yeah, I, I loved being in the classroom and my, my boys were little still, so it was just worked perfectly that I was uh, in a school setting and school holidays I had off, so I didn't need to find anyone to look after my boys and I had that time off with them as well. Um, I feel being in a primary school has really helped me understand families, community, and as the years went by and I've been in the classrooms for such a long time, I was approached by my principal at the time who um, wanted me to introduce myself to other parents in the school who needed a friend. And I was very happy to do that. I'm very friendly. And, uh, yeah, just loving, love making that connection with people. And ten years ago, the hub uh, position came up and I was approached my then by my then principal to, um, to go for the position and offered me the job as a community hub coordinator. I had no idea what a community hub coordinator. I didn't even know what a hub was. And uh, after a lot of um, explaining and researching and chatter, uh, I thought, yeah, you know, I think I could do this. And I was already doing it anyway, because I come from an EAL background. My family comes from Egypt. I speak Arabic. And uh, a lot of our families come from Syria and Iraq. And I was there to help them with the language, to translate for them, to be their friend, to encourage their children to be at school every day and to uh, understand their own culture as well was really important. Um, I really loved the fact that I could be with the principal at the time when there was a new arrived family that came into the school and just meeting them and them knowing that I speak Arabic they were just so relieved because they had come from war-torn countries. They were uh, isolated. They had no family in the area or very little family. And uh, having someone who understood the culture really made a difference. This is what Hub is about, is understanding your families, making that connection, understanding that education is important. But also, as we say at St Dominic's, we don't just enrol the child, we enrol the whole family. That is super important. It's a one-stop shop. You bring your ch children to school, you, um, you come into the hub, have a cuppa, we get to know the families, we find out what their needs are, how can we help them, and it just snowballs from there. We have lots of activities happening in the hub uh, at the moment, um, a lot of parenting programs, uh, English classes, English conversational classes. We have cooking classes, um, play group, of course, as Ruth, you were saying as well. It's an integral part of our community. We have to start at early years and build our way up. It's really important. Um, and just from incidental conversations that you would have with families and uh, working in the classrooms as well as in the hub, I get to see the journey of the whole family, especially when they start from early years, from the playgroup, and they continue on through primary school. And, and even when those children go into high school, and because their siblings are still in primary school, they'll come back and visit us. And it's just a beautiful story and a, and a beautiful journey that a lot of the families have. Uh, we also encourage families to, or parents to further their education. So when they're studying English, we're looking at other ways that we can uh, try to empower them into doing other things as well. And um, I'm going to just tell you a little story about Mirna. Mirna 
started in our school in 2017. She came from Syria and uh, her daughter was in year five. She had hardly, she had no immediate family, but she had her in-laws and she brought her daughter to school. I was working in her daughter's class at the time and we met, we connected, we spoke Arabic together and uh, and I asked her, you know, I said to her, you know, we've got English class if you'd like to join me and I'd introduce you to the teacher and she did and she came and she did the English class at school for a couple of years and then she was getting better and better. Our English class is at zero level. It's at beginners, the beginners of the beginners. It's hi, how are you? And so on. So after a couple of years, she got better and better and then moved on to Kangan. Um, Kangan Institute has uh, English classes as well for families and parents. And so from that, um, she... I need to look at my notes because she's done so much. Um, she's also uh, ended up coming back to the school and volunteering in the school community with Breakfast Club, with um, lots of other um, childcare minding as well. Uh, she ended up uh, studying her Cert 3 in Ed support. She came back to St Dominic's to do her placement. We involved her in other programs like the Government House Peace and Prosperity Garden program. She eventually wanted to pay back to the community and help other new migrants out. So she started uh, her course uh, in training for the, the Volunteer Tutor Scheme. With the Volunteer Tutor Scheme training, she then was able to tutor other new arrived community members in their own home who couldn't come out to the hub or go to the uh, Kangan Institute. Um, and from there, she has uh, looked into applying for a job back at St Dominic's as a learning support officer. She now works in the classrooms and assists newly arrived families and she's in office admin, answering phone calls and uh, meeting new families that come in and is helping everybody else. Sounds like a familiar story, yeah? <laughs> Um, so, as I said, the hub is a one-stop shop. Uh, we have lots of different programs happening in the hub. There's something for everyone. Uh, I can't tell you which one's my favourite because I love them all for various reasons, but I need to mention that um, we have had a St Dominic's men's group. So many things happened in the St Dominic's men's group. We had that running for over five years and unfortunately COVID hits and I and I don't like to say it but sometimes it's a blessing. We were able to get online, we continued to do our programs online and interacting with the men and it was another different, um, you know, issues and concerns that they had. It was very different to face-to-face. -to -face. They were all very worried. They were worried about their children being stuck at home in front of a screen. They were worried that they couldn't go to the shops. They felt trapped again because this is where they had already come from. So all these mental health issues had started again. And it wasn't just with the men's group. It was with everybody across the board. So um, we helped them as much as we could. We had professionals and stakeholders who were also part of the men's group. And this is how we uh, tried to have other service providers come in to help out. Uh, we had Foundation House come in. We had a psychologist. We also had uh, uh, someone from Lintara uniting Parent Next. And uh, we all band together and to help these men uh, with their issues and concerns. Uh, how much time do I have? Yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we have lots of programs and I'll be talking uh, a little later on as well about what other things that we do. Uh, another program that we have is the swimming program for adults. We have four classes happening at the moment at the Broadmeadows Aquatic and Leisure Centre. It's been a great success. It's been running from 2016. I, that's probably my biggest baby because 
there, there was no other swimming program in any of the hubs happening. So, um, yeah, we were the first ones and it's still going and I'm just very proud of, of that program especially. Thank you, Caroline. There's so much to say. There isn't there. Now, to, to try and give some sort of space and form to, to, to these <laughs> deep human needs, uh, to, to try and bring the, the, the broad policy aspirations at state and local government level down to the, those connections and services, is the job of architects, in part, and Lawrence Robinson is... Um, somebody who's worked on a, a number of these projects. Lawrence is a director of Brand Architects, which is a Melbourne practice focused on the delivery of community infrastructure. Lawrence worked on the Corrine Birley uh, project, of course, which you may um, talk about. Uh, and um, Brand Architects is, is uh, a linkage partner in our project, and we're delighted to have you, Lawrence. Welcome. Thanks, Ian. Um, as, as Ian said, our, our practice is um, really devoted to the idea of community infrastructure and, and really doing good for community. And um, I've spent most of my career um, in that area, apart from spending six months doing retail, which I very quickly realised was not for me. Um, and uh, just going back to what Ruth said, I've, I'm, I, mean, I think I'm one of the people that really got passion for community and that's what's driven me pretty much throughout my career. Um, uh, I was... I will say that being an architect is sort of at the back end and, and the architecture in one, at one level is, is the easiest bit of all of this because by the time you get to the architect, there's usually a brief, there's usually been some strategic planning going on, um, someone's come up with some money from somewhere to, to build a building, um, hopefully there's some money to actually run the programs in the building at the end of it all, but uh, so doing, doing, the, doing the architecture um, usually becomes this confined thing and um, I, I found in my career that I wanted to branch out from that. I, I was actually quite interested in the stuff that all sits behind this. And so um, being a good dad, I, I sort of got involved in my daughter's creche about 20 years ago and couldn't just drop her, drop her off at creche. I had to rebuild the building. Um, uh, when that was done, uh, I became the public officer for the creche and actually was involved in running the creche for about 10 years until my kids had sort of gone through and... Uh, I, I no longer had an excuse and that gave me a really big insight into into a lot of the operational and management things that sit behind the architecture and um, I think that actually has helped me with the design work that we do as well because I can sort of understand people's perspectives coming into the design. Um, I put this image up on the um, screen because um, about eight years ago um, for some unknown reason uh, we put in a bid to write the Municipal Early Years Service Plan for Horsham um, Council. God knows why. Everybody in the office said, what are you doing? Like, architects don't do this. <laughs> and these, these guys will know that architects don't do this stuff. But I thought, oh, we'll, we'll give it a crack. We'll just put the tender in. There's probably, a, there might be a hub project at the end of it, maybe. Um, and for some reason, council actually gave us the job, and I still have no idea why they did that. Um, but... For those of you who, who don't know, the, the Municipal Early Years Service Plan really talks about, talks to the, uh, all of the services and how they're going to be managed and run within the community. That's probably a short version of that. Um, and um, up in Horsham, for, for what seems to be quite a tight-knit little town and um, council, there are all these different organisations and, and some of them up there. Um, and for most part, before we got involved, none of them had talked to each other. Or they, if they did, it was just where they needed to, like where there was a crossover with a service or with some issue with a family. And um, being the architects we are, we wanted to approach this holistically. So we said, let's get everybody in the room and, and start to actually talk about the services plan. And um, without wanting to go on for half an hour, the, the outcome of it was the Horsham Early Years Services Network, uh, where everybody, all of these organisations put a representative in, they all meet, they now all meet monthly, um, they plan out their services together, try and make sure there's o no overlaps, try to make sure that they aren't going for competing funding so that, and they try and maximise the funding they've got. And I think um, if there's one thing that came out of the work we did, apart from the services plan, was the fact that this network came together. Um, we then, out of that, did manage to win the hub project 
um, in um, Kalki Road in North Horsham, which is the sort of lowest socioeconomic area in Horsham, and um, a lot of Aboriginal families, a uh, lot of very poor families, and um, just next to this hub, about two doors down, is a, a Salvos that um, runs community lunches every week, and went along to one of those to sort of talk to the community about what they wanted in the hub, and uh, realised that there's a lot of need in this community, and um, I think the benefits of the architecture are that um, it, ca it, it provides the place for people to gather. So we can talk about the one front door and, the, and, the, and wanting to um, have the, the co-location and the integration of the services, but the, the architecture provides the place in which those can happen. Um, and this hub, the brief evolved out of the early years services plan and, and a lot of the agencies now uh, inhabit this hub. We got a lot of, um, we did a lot of consultation with the local Indigenous um, Land Council and the local Indigenous community and there was a real, real issues before this hub was built about getting engagement with the in Indigenous families of the area and because they were involved in the design and planning of this they, they then felt ownership of it so they felt like they were able to come in and use the building and felt part of it and I think that's also had some big benefits. Um, we also got them involved in um, in, a, in a little bit of public, there was some public art money that came to the project and this is just uh, our landscaper Evan Golke from Oka Landscapes who's absolutely fantastic designer, um, got sat down and talked to the local Indigenous people about how they built their fish traps and um, then he went back in his garage and sort of knocked this one up and it's a bit of an oversized fish trap uh, as you can see the, oop, the the fish are sort of swimming through it and they move with the sun and um, not only is it really good at catching fish, it's really good at catching kids and um, so we, we now start to put these things at the front of our um, early years hubs to actually slow the kids down before they get to the car park. It, so it certainly beats having a gate with a childproof latch on it. Um, this is Corin Birrelli, um, which Ruth has talked a bit about and um, the the one thing I want to highlight here is around some of the difficulties with the architecture. Um, the connection with the school didn't automatically happen. There was a lot of discussion with our place about the funding. Um, Julius Coleman, who's the sort of the philanthropic um, engine room behind our place and the Coleman Foundation, um, basically came along and said, we're going to put three million into the programs, but you guys have to sort of do the building and it's got to have one front door and one place where the families can come to. And so we started work on the hub, which was funded by the city of Greater Geelong, largely. Um, and we knew that there could be a connection there, but um, it wasn't there at the, the start of the project. So we actually had to work out how we were going to build the building and have this one front door and connect it to the school later. So when we finally did get some funding, because I think Julius went and had lunch with the minister or something, and all of a sudden one and a half million dollars showed up. Um, that's how things are done, I think. <laughs> Uh, we had to sort of work out how we we're going to cross the boundary here, have the have the front door connect into the school, move the school admin from over here to over here. Uh, there's a uh, the main drain that drains the entire part of this p entire part of Karai runs right through the middle of the building. So there are a lot of physical issues that came about, but um, I think it's been a very successful outcome in the in the way that that's come together. Uh, and then the other project I've worked on that's um, most people know about is Doveton College, which is, is Julius's lighthouse project. And that's really where the one front door thing came up, um, came from. That when we started this project, um, I got a call from the, the uh, what is now the VSBA, but the Education Department region. And they said, oh, this guy's rocked up and had lunch with the minister and he wants to give him $20 million to build a new school. Uh, can you tell us what it needs to have in it? And that was it. We, there was no brief, and we had to sort of invent the brief by talking to people. Um, but you know, in in true department style, they said we've got to stick to the error entitlements, except for the bit over here, which Julius has uh, got the money for. Um, how do we do that? And so we spent a lot of time actually trying to understand how you could you make a school more than a school because. We didn't have enough money to do all the extra bits of space, like ideally this building would have been twice as big um, as it was, but we had to actually work out how we could make all the school space work twice as hard. So we did these little diagrams about how you could make a school run from seven in the morning till 10 o'clock at night and how you could use all the spaces and um, 
yeah, there was a lot of work done around that to actually work out how you could actually make the school work as a community hub. Um, and I think this, this building in particular has been really embraced by its community and had, has had some fantastic outcomes uh, over the past 10 years. And I might finish there because Ian's looking at me like he's a bit nervous and we need to answer some questions. Thank you, Lawrence. Not nervous always. <coughs> Very interested in, in how you wrangle the complexities. <coughs> the complexities uh, in this area. Look, I thought um, we might throw it open for Q&A and, and we'll finish in the, uh, on the hour at, at a quarter past. So um, over to you, audience. Any questions for any of our panellists? Uh, any challenges of what you've heard? Anyone like to explore anything further? Uh, up the back now, a microphone will come up for you if you don't mind, if you, if you could just wait. Thank you. Hello, uh, Chris from Musk Architecture Studio. Um, as an architect, I'm always interested in the physical spaces. Thinking about all the projects that you've been through, what is the top space in your project that derives or underpins the community outcomes? Great question. Great, um, great question. Who, who'd um, like to go first? Could you all have a go at that, please? Look, um, that, that's a really good question because it's amazing how... Um, a space when uh, simple as it is, when it's actually been uh, embedded in the design can transform a community. I would say now, um, 20 years ago, early years facility will be basically a gate and you walk in and you drop your children and then you go, um, you leave. But now there's no way, in from, from certainly from our team, in terms of design that there's no community gathering space. As, an, as, a, as a key function, uh, key component of any early years facility, for instance. That means like a, a space dedicated to waiting area, to gathering, where the, pa the, um, the, the bike park. So there's a, a community kind of opportunity for parents to actually stay back for a couple of minutes to actually catch up with each other. Um, our, our most recent hub, for instance, uh, we just finished two uh, over the last couple of years, that actually been a, ma a major feature that was actually a non-negotiable. Uh, and what we found from that was the, um, I again, is that social connection between f parents, family, um, and, uh, and play space and that connection is so integral part of that now. So, so that, that's a really good, um, certainly uh, an observation over the last two decades, the transformation of that and how that's built in. From my perspective, I was walking into some of our centres today and just looking and what did it feel like for someone coming in from the community into this space and the first thing I noticed was the people who were there. So the space was there but it was the people that were there who actually greet you and show you the spaces that you have. I mean obviously we have great community spaces where we are encouraging lots of activity to happen but when you walk in and you see the beauty and the design of things that children have actually contributed to and the community have actually contributed to, and you feel a sense of safety as well, because we have a number of different cultural uh, people from a lot of different cultural backgrounds, and for them to actually feel safe to come into that space, that very first point, the things that we show is we show respect to our community. So we show respect by the actual design from the, the minute they get out of their car there's beautiful artwork that, as we said, we have the eel trap out the front of our centre as well. But you can already see a sense of respect for that particular community. And that, I think, has been one of the most important things for us. No matter what you build, it has to take that into consideration. I agree with you, Ruth. That was really well said. Um, I've got to say that when I started with the hub, there was no building. We had to make do with what we have. And it's so true, you need to have that personable relationship with people, that making sure that they feel safe and comfortable and, you know, trustworthy within the greeting as well. And the whole school is a hub. We need to remember that even though we have a hub building, it's the people that are in the whole school. So for the moment you walk into the school, everyone needs to be welcoming. 
And don't get me wrong, when we got the hub building, it was amazing. <laughs> it made a big difference. But um, I love the fact that our hub is right near the car park. So parents can literally park in front of the hub, take the pram out, take the kids out, and then come into the hub, have their little session of play group, and off they go again. So um, having it easy accessible is really does make a difference. Um, I'd sort of agree with what they're saying and say it's the foyer because if someone can't walk into the front door of a community hub and feel at home, once at home, they'll just walk out again, particularly people, families who are um, in trauma or have special needs. Um, they need to be made comfortable the moment they walk in the door and not just, yeah, with the people but also with the space, with the, the light, the, the surfaces, the materials, all of those things. And then beyond that, it's the wayfinding. Actually, if I could add, um, certainly uh, um, uh, my panel colleague can probably share, certainly from a local government perspective, I think you could expect into the future, or even now into the future, that there will be a great expectation that uh, any community hub in terms of its design will actually need to demonstrate or reflect the, the complexity and the... Um, social aspiration within the community itself. Uh, for instance, in our uh, community infrastructure plan for the next couple of decades, um, we got eight key principles there that actually represent all of the social uh, aspiration of the community. So that reflects issues of climate change, issues of human rights, issues of LGBTQ+, uh, gender equality, so all of the social principle. Uh, will be the guiding principle that we'd be expecting or pushing for for any kind of design of any future hubs and infrastructure. So, any other questions in the audience? Um, one and then two. Uh, Mike's just coming down. Thanks, Beck. Um, in the middle, yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, this is fantastic. Um, my name is Freya and this is my colleague Marua. We work with Debney Meadows Primary School opposite the Flemington Public Housing Estate and are in the process of setting up a community hub. Now, this is an amazing session because we are doing all the programs. We have the relationships, the trust, the safety, um, and it's coming from the community. Uh, Marua was a mother, very similar story, is also Egyptian <laughs> and speaking Arabic and with our families. Lots of moving parts and balls in the air at the moment. Would love a few million dollars to um, <laughs> change the building. <laughs> um, my question is, <laughs> um, and I think a lot of it is coming back to that passion. Um, there's a lot of unpaid hours happening, a lot of programs just being pulled together um, from very little. Um, my question is like, what, what advice could you give us in terms of taking that next step to making this hub concept at the school, which really needs it, it's um, the community would love it so much um, to making it a reality in a more sustainable way where it's not perhaps just based on a few individuals working incredibly hard and unpaid often to make that happen. Have you got um, partnerships with the school and relationships Very with the Very close school partnership well? with the so, school. So what's their take? What is their kind of drive? They're absolutely on board. Yep. So we have the partnerships, yep. the, the network, the, the, the families are on board, the programs are happening. Mm. So are you after a building or do you have the building? Or you we have the space, yep. um, but the space isn't fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. So it makes it difficult, yeah, to run the programs. It's really loud, echoey. It's one of the things that I find difficult is actually the entrance and getting, um, you know, we have it locked at the moment, families have to come in. Um, yeah, and we're just sort of trying to work out that next step to pull this all together. Sounds like funding. Yeah. <laughs> What's the relationship with the new community centre that's going up? At Good. Meadows? They're they're piloting some programs through us, um, and 
ideally the two hubs would be connected. And it's so admirable that people like yourselves have actually got that passion into driving it. Mm. But you do, you need, you know, there's only so many hours in a day and then there's only so many people that can do certain things. So there has to be that next kind of level of commitment and you're about to talk about social planning. <laughs> so here's the owner of the building that you wanting to improve on at the moment. It's within a school. Within a school. Do you know what? I, I think um, it's amazing you, you already got partnership and you've got, already got parent who are interested in the community behind you, I would just arrange a meeting with your local council uh, and um, contact someone of my equivalent, City of Yarra, would that be the, the council? Um, Mini Valley. Valley. Mini Valley. So I, I would uh, start a conversation with your local council to explore possibility because you're almost like, you're 60-70% there. <laughs> Yeah. Really, um, I really similar. I mean, even just a few weeks ago, I had a similar request coming through from a little kinder, a one room kinder, bush kinder. They are very passionate, uh, community management. So we met with them, and now we've got a project brief going on uh, that would actually look at redevelopment of their centre. So I, I would um, just um, find out who your contact is in your local council and have that initial conversation. Thank you. Involve the department as well. Yeah. I mean, you could, it, you know, hopefully you can get into the, the next round of capital work budget. Yeah, I was you just going to say lots of lobbying, because usually, yeah. Yeah, well, to be quite honest, we've just had capital works denied, um, and the school doesn't have heating, for instance. We should talk. <laughs> I cycle past you every day. <laughs> so I asked for a meeting with your local council and your rep for your department of education. Uh, that that would be a start. Yeah. And, and housing as well, Department of Housing. Thanks. That's an illustration of the complexity of um, of this multi-jurisdictional, multi-sectoral area. Look, I think we've got time for one more, and I think Lisa was. Um, I think it's Lisa. Uh, thank you. Um, most of you talked about the community or communities that are already associated with the school. I wonder if you want to speak about the broader community. So I've got a school around the corner that I was very involved with when I had kids at school, but I haven't been there for many, many years. So whether you want to talk about the role that schools might play for the broader community. Yeah, you go. <laughs> I was going to say, um, at St Dominic's, uh, we have the church as well. So there's the parish and parishioners that come to mass. And... Uh, we always try to engage with the parishioners and the wider community and the neighbourhood houses that are in the area and other hub schools that are in the area. Part of Community Hubs Australia, Hume has the original hubs uh, in Victoria. So we're coming up to our 10-year anniversary. Uh, when I was talking about the swimming program before, uh, it's not just for parents from St Dominic's. I have uh, parents from all of the hubs almost in the area as well. And some parents are not part of the hubs but have seen the program, it's been advertised, they are welcome to join us as well. So it's trying to get the message out there for everybody in our community. And a lot of, and you, you form partnerships with the service providers as well. and. Uh, and people start knowing about what programs you have in your hub. So it's really important to build those relationships with service providers and the outer community and council and Centrelink and anywhere that people go, but especially other primary schools, high schools in the area. If I could just add on that one, I think you highlight um, a really, really important area uh, and, and one that need a great deal of attention. For instance, I mean, on, on an average each week, we, our team, receive about six or seven different requests for community group needing a place to meet. And we just can't um, respond to all of them. And I'm sort of, um, and, and, and we still, um, we got in the planning process, but still a long, long way to go in terms of what happened to all of our school after hours. Could you imagine, I mean, that would solve my problem a lot <laughs> in terms of the need of our community who are active, ready, they're connected, 
they just need uh, infrastructure that support you know their their uh, share interest. Um, it, it, I think we're still in a really early days, unfortunately, in that space. Um, I'm hoping that ten or twenty years from now, that will be a common practice that we have moved beyond the the you know the uh, exclusion kind of mentality that's still operating now. So at the moment, it's still very ad hoc, very subjected to the the principal that's heading up a school, how open they are. But I think a game changer. And I'm hoping that the state government right here that you know we, we need more leadership in a policy space that really speak to what we're talking about today, uh, moving forward in terms of uh, a community hub that actually can be um, you know can can share that space in terms of school settings. Um, I'm, I'm hoping over the next two decades that would actually transform that. But where we are now, I, I still. Um, think we're still in the very early days of that. I'll just jump in. Yeah, one quick comment. Um, I am reminded um, that a, a lot of schools are doing this, and uh, I am reminded that the BER program, you know, 12, 13 years ago, all the schools that got um, halls um, were told they had to use those halls after hours for the community at minimal cost. And there is a lot of it that going on, but I, I think there's a lot more that could go on. And, and there is policy behind it, it's just that things fall apart sometimes at the local level. And for us, it's been a partnership with our place. So our place have done a lot of research in our local community and it's that strategic planning and the strategies about supporting families in that local community, bringing people into those spaces, running programs that actually meet the community's needs that they've identified with the number of services. So, you know, from birth to, to adulthood and even sort of in old age, there's lots of programs that the community itself need. So how we then target the people that need those particular things and have the services that actually support those things happening. So whether it be walking groups, coffee mornings, um, adult education programs, again, we have partnerships with the, the local, uh, local learning and employment network up the road, the Cultura, the cultural diversity program around the corner. So, you know, the, the word is spreading far and wide. So people within that broader community who are, aren't just coming to our services for school or um, long daycare kindergarten programs are actually able to access the services as well. So, so much to say. Um, so infrastructure matters, but relationships matter. And uh, a bit of funding doesn't hurt either. Um, can we, uh, Lawrence, could you advance the slide by one, please? So you can, yep, uh, see where to connect with us on the socials. Uh, can I ask you to thank our panel th so much for a fascinating. <laughs>